the amazing prowess of America's First Ladies and the man who knows them best. My conversation with Andrew Oak, America's First Ladies man, starts right now. Welcome to Conversations. I'm Nancy Brinker. The position of First Lady is unelected and unpaid, but holds enormous sway with the President and the public. Often their accomplishments don't get the credit they deserve. My guest today is working to change that. Andrew Oak calls himself the First Lady's Man, and he's the author of the two-volume set, Unusual for Their Time, detailing these often amazing women. Andrew, thanks for joining me, and thank you for writing these books. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for having me here. I, I've, I'm, I'm excited at the opportunity to have a conversation with you today. Thank you. So let's start at the beginning. Most of us know that George Washington married Martha, who was already wealthy. What's less known about her is that she was a beautiful, accomplished businesswoman and had a lot to lose by backing the revolution. How did that play into her role as First Lady? Well, you know, most of us, we the people, we look at Martha Washington as this older, almost grandmotherly woman with gray hair and an apron. She had a life <laughs> before George Washington. She was married before George Washington. And that marriage to Daniel Park Custis made her a very wealthy woman. In fact, it's not out of the, uh, uh, it, it's very, very appropriate to think of her as the first successful businesswoman of the colonies of the new world because her husband, her first husband died and left her a very wealthy 26 year old widow. Enter General George Washington and he basically married up. And for what Martha had to risk and put aside the land, the acres of profitable tobacco land outside of Williamsburg, the real estate in Williamsburg, the cash that she had on hand from her first marriage is all things, all things that she that General Washington needed to conduct himself during the Revolutionary War. Martha had to stay home and protect this wealth and protect this land. And if she couldn't do that, then George would have had to, then he wouldn't have been able to lead the revolution. It went on longer than everyone thought, and Martha Washington, at the request of General Washington, traveled to nearly every winter encampment of the Revolutionary War, mm -hmm. and she hosted very important political dinners, very important political discussions, uh, advised General Washington after everyone went home. It's not a stretch to say that if George Washington had married anyone other than Martha Dandridge Custis, we would not be America. That's very interesting. In reviewing your book, it appears that almost all the men who later became president married up. Either their spouse came from wealth or they were incredibly smart or both. How do the opinions of these first ladies shape policy? Well, it's interesting. I think that these women, especially in the 1700s and 1800s, before women could vote, before women could have formal educations, bank accounts, own land, have money of their own, wealth of their own, really. Um, they, they were attracted to these men that were going places. And the men that were going places that had established these, these legal careers and these, these, these roles of leadership within their communities and even at the federal level later, these women were attracted to them because they were of natural intelligence. They had the aptitude. They had thoughts. And they had to hitch their ideas mm. and their thoughts in their lives to these men who would be these political stars because these first ladies, unelected and unpaid, however, they are among the most powerful and influential unpaid and unelected women in the world in this position of first lady because they have the ear of one of the most powerful men in the world. A lot of us probably don't recall too many of our initial first ladies by first name, but I think most of us know the name Dolly Madison. What made Dolly Madison so memorable? And did she set the stage of what we now think of as a first lady? Yeah, very much so. What Dolly Madison very specifically did was she set the stage and set the standard and the bar very high for entertaining in the White House. She's the first first lady to do this on a grand scale, especially with large parties and state dinners. And, and she had a knack for politics. She had an interest in politics. She had a knack for entertaining. And she knew to put two people with different <laughs> ideas next to each other in a seating chart so they could talk and 
work out things. You realize that, that these dinners and these events at the White House and these political meetings and these negotiations were often held over dinners and social events. We didn't have phones and email and all the communication uh, elements. Even newspapers were kind of sketchy and, and you know, the postal service and things like that. Everything took longer. So the way to get things done was to put people in the same room together. And more specifically was to put people sitting next to each other. So these types of events, how you entertained, what types of food were served, if anything were to go awry, especially with foreign diplomacy here on United States yeah. on American soil, things could go horribly wrong because they would think, well, this woman doesn't know what she's talking about. This woman doesn't <laughs> know what she's doing. Why would I listen to her husband? Why would I listen to who I'm yeah. sitting next to? I had a horrible time at dinner. But diplomats often said that Dolly entertained as though she had been to every finest finishing school across Europe. And Dolly Madison is one of the only, especially early first ladies, that never stepped foot outside of the United States. So this, this woman, Dolly Madison, had this type of knowledge and this type of ability to set the stage for entertaining and diplomacy in the White House. And it's followed by nearly every first lady to, to come after her. Well, not all of America's first ladies <clears throat> were married to the president. We'll talk about that next. Welcome back to Conversations, where I'm talking about first ladies with Andrew Oak, author of Unusual for Their Time. You know, Andy, in my work with breast cancer, I've been fortunate to have interacted with several first ladies, including Nancy Reagan, Laura Bush, Betty Ford, even Happy Rockefeller, who was the vice president's wife. All very impressive women in their own right who had had breast cancer, and even though they had significant health issues and yet still managed to embrace the role. Did most Americans know, for instance, that Mamie Eisenhower had a serious heart issue? How did that impact her time at the White House? Well, that's an interesting question, Nancy. Uh, Mamie was told by her doctor that she was not to work more than two or three days a week. Mm -hmm. Mamie was a workhorse. Mamie was an organizer. Mamie came from military background with General Dwight yeah. Eisenhower. You know, she, mm -hmm. she ran her household when she was a, the wife of a general with military precision and brought that into the White House. So sitting and taking it easy was not in the cards for her. So what she made a deal with her doctor that she would work every day, but she would not get out of bed until noon. So what she did was she had a number of, she was also just a, a wonderful, beautiful dresser too. She had more in, in all of my travel studying, all of the first ladies that I did, no one had a clothes collection like Mamie Eisenhower. And she had a number of, of bed coats, house coats, pink, lovely, beautiful chiffon and feathers and all kinds of things that she would get her hair and makeup done. She would make herself presentable, put on these lovely house coats and invite her entire staff into her bedroom. She would sit in bed. They would lay the papers out on the, the bed and she would have a staff meeting every day at noon. And then she would get out and, and, and perform her duties and do what it is. But she's one of the first first ladies to really take over the White House budget and the White House scheduling as first lady for the entire executive mansion, just not, you know, uh, 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 social duties and, and her uh, role as first lady out of the East Wing. She did this for the entire White House. And she ran that with the same type of military precision and, uh, and success that she did as the general's wife. I think we all assume that the first lady is the woman married to the president, but that's not necessarily the case. Tell me, for example, the role Harriet Lane played. Yeah, well, it, it is, you know, we think of the first lady as the wife of the president. In modern times, we haven't seen a, a, a president without a wife that served as first lady since the Wilson administration in the 19 teens when his first wife died, Ellen died of a kidney disease, Bright's disease, and his daughter took over until he remarried Edith. So this is a phenomenon that we don't know in modern times, but Harriet Lane is the niece of James Buchanan, our 15th president of the United States. James Buchanan 
is the is the uh, uh, the first of only two bachelor presidents to be elected, uh, James Buchanan the first, and then Grover Cleveland the second. So he brought his niece in as a stand-in. In the 1800s, we see a lot of this. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, for instance, uh, uh, he was not well. He was a widower. His wife died 20 years before he was elected president. So his daughter stood in. So these female family members often take over the role for an ailing first lady or wife or one that's not there because she has died. Or in the instance of Harriet Lane, a president that never married James Buchanan. But Harriet Lane was so well-educated, so well-traveled, so intelligent, so remarkable. When she died, her art collection was donated to the Smithsonian, and she's the reason we have a National Gallery of Art. Wow. She started that art collection. She very tragically lost so many people in her family, her parents, which is why she was the ward of her uncle, President James Buchanan, and lost her husband and two children. And what she did with that sorrow and that pain was she turned it into a positive and started what is currently the children's ward at Johns Hopkins Medical University in Baltimore, one of the nation's biggest and best for children's medical help. So she really took this position and turned things into a positive. And it's, it's number one, she's not even the wife of a president. And number two, we probably wouldn't name her or know about her if we were naming 20, 30, 40 first ladies or official White House hostesses. So just a truly remarkable woman. Edith Wilson, wife of President Woodrow Wilson, has been called our secret president. What kind of outside role did she have? Well, as I mentioned just previously, that she was the second wife of, of Woodrow Wilson. She comes into the White House without children. Wilson's children were all older at that point, his, his daughter Margaret uh, handling the White House uh, first lady hostess duties in the, in the interim there. And Edith Wilson, again, another naturally intelligent, very smart woman, interested in politics and interested in her husband's career. What the Wilsons had was President Wilson kept a file cabinet, a handheld file cabinet, and all of the papers from the day that were not dealt with during the day and during office hours were put into this file cabinet, different drawers for different priorities of papers. And Edith Wilson and President Wilson every night would take that upstairs to the residence and she would help him go over these important papers and issues of the day. So she was already in this role of involvement in her husband's administration and the presidency. Then Wilson had a stroke, a debilitating stroke, and he went into his bedroom. Mrs. Wilson shut the door and told the country and part of the administration and Congress, the president is exhausted, suffering from exhaustion and needs rest. No one can see him but me. So for months, no paper conversation element of the presidency, element of our country as it related to the presidential administration or the White House business, made it into Wilson's bedroom without her approval. And there's no doubt with an incapacitating stroke that the president had that Mrs. Mrs. Wilson was making decisions, presidential decisions, that the country, Congress, and parts of the administration did not know. She is our first unofficial female president of the United States. Well, another first lady with an oversized impact was Eleanor Roosevelt. What's her most significant accomplishment? I tell you, it, they're, they're almost too numerable to, to even <laughs> count or prioritize. Uh, but the most significant is that FDR would never have been president without his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. It's, it's about this time that he contracts polio or is diagnosed with polio. And his mother, Sarah Delano, said, well, that's it for you. you you're, you're sick. You will stay home. You'll be the lord of the manor. We're Roosevelt's. We've got plenty of money. You've done your public service. You've done your, your, your good deed for society and the country. Now it's time to retire. Well, Eleanor knew that that would almost trap her in the Roosevelt home. So she hired a political advisor reinvigorated and revived her husband's political career, got him back into politics, got him back into the White House to be the longest serving president in an unprecedented and unrepeated four terms, thus her the longest first lady in history, where she, she could be remarkably influential and set her up for that role to continue after the White House in so many uh, United Nations roles for human
humanitarianism uh, around the world. In more contemporary times, it's tough to think of first ladies that were more universally beloved than both Barbara and Laura Bush, both wonderful friends to me, both with their own distinct personalities. What is it about the Bush women that appealed to so many people across party lines? They're nice people, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, I, I, in 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 my travels, in my studies, in my research, I've met so many different Marine One pilots, Air Force One pilots, White House butlers, White House pastry chefs, Secret Service agents, and nine times out of ten, anyone that works for the position of president or works for the executive mansion as a staffer for multiple administrations, nine out of 10, maybe even 10 out of 10 will say their absolute favorite was Barbara Bush mm. and Laura Bush with a close second there. They're nice people. They treated people well. They were interested in the people that they worked with and worked around and the people that worked for them. A uh, Secret Service agent, I had, the, I had the, the very distinct honor of memorializing Barbara Bush. I've been able to memorialize Barbara Bush, uh, Nancy Reagan, and Rosalind Carter to great, uh, 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 the, the honor, incredible, something that I, I hold very special, near and dear to my heart. And this one Secret Service agent said he took a trip post White House. His duty was to take care of Barbara Bush post White House. And they went to China. She was going there to visit. And Mrs. Bush was more interested in him getting a gift for his wife and not getting ripped off at one of these open air <laughs> markets and took him around to find gifts for his wife and his whole family before she would go home. They're just genuinely nice people and people like to be around them because of it. When we come back, I'm going to ask Andy about the first lady he's most impressed with and the one who had the biggest impact on the interior of the White House. That's next. I'm continuing my conversation with Andrew Oak, author of Unusual for Their Time. As an expert in first ladies, Andrew, can you share which first lady was most impressed with and why? Well, you know, it's a question I get asked a lot in my position. And having done research on every first lady, Martha Washington through now Dr. Jill Biden, <laughs> it's impossible to pick one. But one of the top one of the most impressive and incredible first ladies is someone that I didn't even know was a first lady before I started, and most people <laughs> don't, Lou Hoover. Mm -hmm. Lou Hoover is such an accomplished, was such an accomplished woman, even before in the White House. Mm -hmm. She was an accomplished young woman. She wrote essays about women doing things and growing to greatness in times before they could vote, before education, formal education for first ladies, before women could have bank accounts, before any of these things that women would eventually have. Lou Hoover was writing about this in the late 1800s. She also was the first woman in America to graduate with a geology degree. She graduated from Stanford University. And that geology degree is what introduced her to her husband, Herbert Hoover, who was in geology classes with her at Stanford. The two would travel around the world to be self-made millionaires by the time they were 30 and the first presidential administration not to take a salary. She also, in these travels, taught herself six or seven different languages, including Mandarin Chinese. They would wow. donate uh, uh, resources to get American diplomats and their families out of Europe, specifically London, before World War I or as World War I was breaking out. And this was with their own personal funds, having no expectation of being paid back. The things that these two people, President Hoover and Lou Hoover, did for Americans and people in need, they built schools, they paid for the salaries of, 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 of the teachers and the principals of these schools. They even, Lou Hoover very specifically paid for college education for a number of students that had the aptitude, that had the desire, the will to go on and get these college educations. And when Lou Hoover died, she was living in the Waldorf in New York City with her husband out of the White House. Uh, as retired people, basically, retired politicians, retired president, first lady, they found in her desk a box of checks. And some of those checks were from students 
and children that she had paid for their college education. They were trying to pay her back mm -hmm. and she didn't cash the checks. Just wow. an incredible woman that was in the right place at the wrong time because the Great Depression happened just months into Hoover's administration and he could do nothing to, well, he did nothing to cause it and could do not much to fix it in, in that short amount of time. And that was the big reason he wasn't elected or reelected. And even the goodwill that Lou did, she didn't speak about publicly because she thought it was unseemly and inappropriate to talk about gestures of gratitude and brag about them. So she was overly humble, which, worked to her her to not to her benefit or not to her husband's benefit because people just didn't know the great things that these two people did but Lou Hoover just just a, an amazing human being is there a particular first lady who's responsible for the overall interior look of the white house today there is, you know, experts and those who are closer to the executive mansion even than I and have studied over the years, um, you know, since Jacqueline Kennedy made it a national historic landmark and museum and, and expanded the collection of the White House. But Pat Nixon, another quiet and humble first lady. You know, we think of the Nixon administration. A lot of people instantly think of Watergate, of course. But Pat Nixon is a perfect example of how a situation, Lou Hoover, a great example of this as well, and I think about it, of a first lady whose accomplishments are overshadowed by her husband's administration or circumstances that happened during their presidency. So... Pat Nixon collected single-handedly, basically, more art, artifacts, and pieces for the White House collection than, than any other first lady. And when you walk through the White House, those who know, know that it's Pat Nixon's White House you're walking through. <laughs> Andrew Oaks, I feel like we can talk about this subject for hours, but unfortunately, our time is up. Once again, the name of the book is Unusual for Their Time worth reading, and you can visit his website, thefirstladiesman.com. That's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me for my next conversation. So long.